Within a man-made breakwater of derelict ships on Canada's west coast lies a possible relic from a fascinating era in American history, the rip-roaring time known as Prohibition. Join the Sea Hunters as they seek the last resting place of the most famous smuggling ship on the west coast, the fabled Queen of the Rum Runners, Malahat. With over 100 million books in print, Clive Custler is the grand master of shipwreck tales and adventure. Director of the Vancouver Maritime Museum, James Delgado is one of the world's foremost marine archeologists. With over 20 years wreck diving experience, Mike Fletcher is an internationally renowned professional diver. Leading the Econova dive team, John Davis has coordinated shipwreck searches around the globe. Together, they explore the planet's last frontier in search of true adventures, the famous shipwrecks. They are the Sea Hunters. Hello, I'm Clive Kessler. Someone once said you can make it illegal, but you can't make it unpopular. This pretty much summed up America's feelings during Prohibition when the 18th Amendment was passed by Congress, making it illegal to distill and sell liquor. From the years 1920 to 1933, America was thirsty for beer and whiskey. By turning off the tap, anti-saloon do-gooders unwittingly created a subculture that inspired gangsters, speakeasies, and organized crime. Seeing an opportunity, many resourceful Canadians were happy to become suppliers, and the Rum Rudder was born. Mariners on the eastern seaboard, across the Great Lakes, and along the west coast happily embraced the smuggling of liquor for fast and easy profits. Now join us as we dive and identify one of the finest examples of a rum running wreck, the fabled Queen of Rum Row, Malahat. Prohibition was an era of gangsters, jazz, and bathtub gin. What started out as a noble experiment soon became a multi-million dollar illegal industry controlled by well-run criminal gangs. Crime lords like Al Capone, Dutch Schultz, and Lucky Luciano ruled entire cities buying off police and politicians and gunning down anyone else who got in their way. Small-time smugglers gave way to the huge syndicates dealing thousands of cases of liquor across the USA, much of it by sea. During the 13 years of Prohibition, one ship delivered more contraband than any other on Canada's west coast, the notorious schooner Malahat. The story of Malahat and her infamous career begins on Canada's west coast in Vancouver, British Columbia. The city of Vancouver was the home port of the rum-running Malahat and the headquarters of Canada's rum-runner fleet. The Sea Hunters have been asked to dive and identify a shipwreck, which some claim may be that of the fable rum-runner. Grab that one, please, yeah. Here, at the Vancouver Maritime Museum, Sea Hunters Mike Fletcher, James yeah. Delgado, and John Davis dive into the archives to learn more about the wreck. What intrigues the Sea Hunters is the uncertainty surrounding the location of Malahat's last resting place. Well, one of the really great mysteries about this search is, is that written history has the wreck as a derelict and as sinking here in Barclay Sound. Oral traditions tell us that she went down way over here in Powell River. What's the distance? 70 miles as the crow flies, or 210 miles with a long, slow tow with a ship with a hole in her side and half full of water. Doesn't make sense. Why would you bring a derelict from here only to finish it off there? Well, that's the mystery. The history books can be wrong, and that's where archaeology steps in. I think we go there, we take a look, we dive it, we match it up archaeologically. We also do more work in the archives to see what we can find, and then hopefully pin the wreck on the chart. The team travels 321 kilometers north, up the coast, to the small mill town of Powell River. This region's oral history casts doubt on the official version of Malahat sinking in Barclay Sound. A local mill worker recalled that in 1945, a half-sunken derelict schooner was towed to the mill pond, still containing its valuable cargo of logs. 
Sometime after the cargo was removed, it is thought the old schooner was scuttled somewhere nearby. Many people in Powell River believe that a wreck found just off their coast is the schooner of the mill workers' account, and once examined, will prove to be none other than the Malahan. Joining the sea hunters in the examination of this wreck are two divers from the Underwater Archaeological Society of British Columbia. All underwater archaeology done in British Columbia is done by a volunteer group, the Underwater Archaeological Society of British Columbia. They survey and map shipwrecks, gathering valuable data that contributes to shipwreck preservation. They often consult people from different areas to ask for their advice or their input. They are a great resource and have a record of being very successful at identifying wrecks. Hey, like a good day. Joining the Sea Hunters crew is Rick James, a local historian who is passionate about the Malahat and her story. When I heard from the Underwater Archaeological Society that they were doing work over here, I said, by all means, I'd like to get involved. Stories were starting to come in that maybe the old rum runner, the mothership to the rum running fleet, the Malahat, she might be on the bottom there. So we, we, we're calling her a mystery wreck right now, but let's find out. The Malahat will always be associated with illegal liquor. In early 20th century America, beer and liquor were big business. Breweries and distilleries competed fiercely for the dollars of the thirsty public, and saloons peddled their wares by the glass. Access to intoxicating drink led some down the sorry road of drunkenness and alcoholism. Prohibition, one of the reasons behind it was the fact that uh, in the early days, uh, alcoholism was the drug addiction of the day. You know, uh, particularly men, you know, after work, particularly if they were laborers, you know, would head to the old saloon and start downing the booze and then stagger home. And, and in the days where there wasn't that much income, the poor wife struggling to put food on the table while the old man's drinking it up. So uh, it became a big crusade by the, the you know, the anti-saloon league to uh, uh, stop the consumption of alcohol. The temperance movement turned sobriety into a political issue. From pulpits across the land, alcohol was decried as a poison which destroyed health and decayed moral fiber. The USA's entrance into the First World War set the stage for the movement's political victory. By effectively equating teetotalism with patriotism in the minds of the public and politicians, the movement turned the tide in Congress. At last, in 1919, Congress passed the 18th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, making prohibition the law of the land. North of the border, Canada had also imposed prohibition laws of its own. Shrewdly, however, Canada did not ban the manufacture of liquor for export. Canadian liquor could be purchased legally if it was for shipment to other nations, including the U.S. This left the door open for Canadian entrepreneurs. Canadian liquor companies such as Seagram's and businessmen such as Samuel Bronfman took advantage of the law and its loopholes. Even with Canada's long undefended border, one of the popular means to get liquor into the U.S. was by boat. These vessels, with their liquid cargo, became known as rum runners. On the East Coast, schooners and fishing vessels supplied the thirsty cities of New York and Boston. On the Great Lakes, steamships and lake vessels delivered to the gangs in Detroit and Chicago. On the West Coast, the liquor was warehoused and delivered to Southern California aboard large motherships. The most successful of these was the Malahat. Her vast holes, designed to carry huge loads of lumber, were filled with thousands of cases of liquor, sometimes 175 different brands. With this liquid cargo secure below, she would leave Vancouver for the waters of Rum Row off the Farallon Islands near San Francisco. There, just outside territorial limits, she operated as a deep sea liquor market.
Rick, what are what are we going to see when we get to the uh, to the actual site? Of, uh, well, you're going to be uh, actually quite impressed. Uh, it's uh, really a, a fascinating site. What's been, what they've used here as protection around the mill site there, around the log pond, is a row of old ships. And now these are not your regular old hulks. These are uh, concrete ships, and they're, they're a fair size. And it's quite impressive. The wreck thought to be the Malahat lies beside a half moon of derelict ships that form a breakwater for the Powell River lumber mill. These vessels were originally constructed out of wartime emergency and were not built of steel, but of concrete. As general purpose carriers, these concrete vessels proved to be slow but effective movers of dry materials like sugar. They were not given to condensation problems which plagued their steel-hulled sisters. How many of us have ever seen a ship that's 350 feet long made out of concrete before? And here we have 10, and, and there you have it. it, it, it this is a uh, part of a program from the United States in the First World War, and uh, there was only a limited amount, a handful of them made, and here they are. Here, there's there's the, the, the example from uh, the First World War, now a, a variety of ships from the Second World War, and they're right there. It, it's, it's wonderful. Before diving, they elect to sail around for a close-up look at the oddities of another era. Well, these concrete ships, they're temporary, emergency-built World War II ships, and they weren't expected to last this long, and yeah. they're incredibly durable. Yeah. So, so they made them more or less because they didn't have steel? Was that the idea? Well, steel was a valuable war commodity, and they could build, they built concrete ships in World War I. They built them again in World War II, and Concrete floats. Anything heavy will float if it displaces water. These large ships, some of them over 106 meters long, weigh over 4,000 tons. Oh my God, it's the quartz. She's US Navy, see the number, IX-150, yeah. that's a catch-all numbering okay. system. She's a, she's a concrete barge, and she was out at Operation Crossroads at Bikini Atoll for the A-bomb test. Really? Jim has recognized one of the concrete ships as the quartz, which was present at Operation Crossroads, the testing of an atomic bomb on Bikini Atoll in 1946. The U.S. government placed several ships near the epicenter of the explosion to assess the damage inflicted by this terrifying weapon. ships picked up a little bit of radiation. And we're not, we're not. No, 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 I mean, it'd be long gone now. Yeah. But uh, she's still got her, look at that. She's still painted and you can see her look gun tubs. The, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's probably for a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft weapon. You can tell she's the got, chains are anchoring because look at the quick lead. Yeah, she's lead got some that. strain on her. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Bruce, let's take her around. Let's go over to the dive site. Yeah, I think it's time to hit the water. As the team turns to their preparations for the dive, they leave behind these monuments to wartime ingenuity. Beneath the waters sheltered by the silent hulks, the sea hunters hope to find a rum runner mothership, a legend of that turbulent time called Prohibition. Near the end of World War I, the losses to shipping inflicted by the German U-boat campaign were so great that all available vessels were pressed into the war effort. This left a shortage of ships at home, and Canadian sawmills were left with no way to get their product to the market. After a fierce lobbying campaign, they at last won government funds for the construction of a fleet of schooners. In total, 12 schooners were built, the Malahat among them. They were designated Mabel Brown class vessels, and each played their part in the Canadian war effort. The wooden shipbuilding program that began in Canada in 1916 saw large numbers of vessels built in British Columbia, which had ready access to a supply of timber in its own forests. Wooden schooners, wooden motor schooners, as well as wooden steamers were built, amazingly enough, at a time when the age of the wooden sailing ship had seemingly passed. 
the wooden vessels were at the forefront of a boom in shipbuilding and shipyards that, while it faltered a bit after the First World War, picked up again with a vengeance during the Second World War. The same British Columbia forests which provided the timbers for Malahat also were the lifeblood for this province's developing lumber industry. Logging camps and sawmills used the rivers and coastal waters for the transport of logs. Today, a paper mill, which used to be the world's largest, is located in Powell River. Mike's son, Warren Fletcher, will act as second underwater cameraman. Jacques Marc is Explorations Director with the Underwater Archaeological Society, and Peter Ross is a diver with the group. A number of sea lions watch with curiosity. Yeah, let's discuss the dive. What I, I think what we probably want to do, Jacques, thank you. you bet, is some of the key stuff for sorting this out. I guess, you know, we really need to get overall size. It's a big wreck. Before coming to Powell River, the team reviewed plans of the Malahat to help them with their diagnosis of what they see on the bottom. The records paint Malahat as a sturdy working ship, a five-masted schooner, more than 74 meters long and registered at 1,550 tons. She was built of British Columbian fur and rigged as a bald-headed schooner, so termed because she supported no topsails. She featured a pair of Bolander semi-diesel engines, but other than powered winches used to hoist her giant mainsails and a steam-powered windlass, everything else on board was hand gear. That said, her designers didn't skimp on comfort. The owner's stateroom featured a coal-burning fireplace, and both the owner's and the captain's cabins boasted full-sized bathtubs. There was even heat in the officer's cabins, an unheard of luxury. Knowledge of these well-documented features will help the divers in their archaeological analysis of the wreck. You know, I agree. Uh, I think we do the standard baseline trick. Let's, let's get an overall length, uh, try to get a breadth. Um, albeit, we know that there's only sort of half of her, uh, her width there, but we should be able to extrapolate that. Yes. Um, we planned two dives. The first dive, when Mike was down to take a look along with the Underwater Archaeological Society group, was intended to be a reconnaissance dive, a first look that would tell us just exactly what was down there, how much of the ship had survived, and what types of features were present. This preliminary exploration would enable me to come up with a dive plan for the second dive that would map in the features and look very carefully at all of the diagnostic evidence. This would allow us to conclude whether or not this was the Malahan. The lights are on. Dropping down on the site, you're immediately struck with the reality of just how badly deteriorated this shipwreck is. No doubt a result of the wood-consuming worms that are so common in salt water. We really had our work cut out for us. We had to go on a hunt for those tiny little details that would definitely identify this wreck as the Malahat. One of the first things that was obvious, and something that you were almost drawn to, were these struts that were holding a large bearing. I recognized immediately that this would have been the bearing that held a propeller shaft. And on further investigation, I could see there was two of them. 
We now knew with certainty we had a wooden ship that was powered by twin propellers. That was great evidence of Malahat. But could we find evidence that this wreck was also a sailing ship? That was our next step. One of the objectives of the dive is to determine the wreck's length. The Malahat was 74 meters long. Well, Jacques laid out the tape measure to get an overall length of the site. I decided to swim towards what should have been the bow. I wanted to get a, a really good sense of just how the wreck lay on the bottom. And as I swam forward down that essentially the spine of the ship. I got the sense that I was an underwater paleontologist, and I was investigating the remains of an old dinosaur. And in effect, that's what we were doing. We were, we were trying to find those, those little bits amongst the broken bones that would resurrect this vessel as the Malahat. Traveling down what would have been the Kielsen or the interior keel of the ship, I was really struck with just truly how large this vessel was. Swimming back towards the stern, Jacques stopped me to point out a chain plate. The chain plates were the anchors, so to speak, that held the lines that ran to the top of the mast that effectively held the mast down into the hull. And when I saw that, I was excited. I thought, we now had proof that this was a sailing ship. But that's not quite true. Even these old wooden ships often had masts for loading cargo, effectively deck booms. What we could say with certainty is that for every set of chain plates, we had one mast. Mallet had, had five masts. The question was, could we find five sets of chain plates? One of the more interesting three-dimensional components of the site were what we believed to be fuel tanks. Since we had really good drawings and measurements from Malahat, we realized that the tanks could in effect become a, a signature that could only be matched to one ship. If we could measure the tanks and we could prove that they could fit theoretically below the decks of Malahat, then we had one more piece mounting evidence. Throughout the years of prohibition, despite the government's best efforts, sobriety did not sweep the nation. During the Roaring Twenties, the per capita consumption of alcohol actually increased dramatically. Americans wanted to drink. So, harnessing the enterprising spirit which made the country great, they set out to circumvent the government provide themselves with drink, and make a few dollars in the process. Saloons, the target of the temperance movement, transformed into underground speakeasies and blind pigs. You know, the speakeasies were primarily in, well, some of the smaller towns, but the major cities. It'd be like a nightclub today, only it was just, you know, harder to get into then. You know, you had to have some, a little bit of influence or know somebody, you know. Because you've seen the movies where you go up and knock on the door and the little hatch comes open and the guy, you know, yeah, and you say, Charlie sent me, you know, okay, and they open the door and you go in. Where there had once been only 16,000 saloons in New York City, tens of thousands of speakeasies sprang up in the wake of the prohibition. And unlike the men-only saloons, these illicit nightclubs and bars were open to women. What Prohibition did for the women, the, it was the older women like mothers, you know, that really pushed for Prohibition. But as the younger women came up, everybody started going wild. People, particularly women, who would have never thought of drinking, begin to drink because you weren't supposed to do it. And that's the way the American public is. You tell them they can't do anything, and they'd say, it's the hell with that, and they go out and do it. And that's what happened, and that's when the flapper came in. You know, the short skirts and then rouging their knees and, the, and the, the hair bobs and the whole bit. And so women all of a sudden just found this freedom that they'd never had before. 
and so they just they just broke loose. So it was a, it was a great opportunity for women to really come out, you know, and have a great deal of fun. After a 25 minute bottom time, the divers surface. Other divers on the line below Mike. Let's get going, bud. Definitely see the evidence of the fuel and water tanks and both the uh, stern uh, struts where the uh, shafts would have come through the hull. When Mike returned from his dive, he told me that he'd found a strut and tanks. This was an indication that we were looking at a vessel that wasn't just a sailing ship, but a vessel that had made use of a motor or an engine. That was pretty key because Malahat had been built as an auxiliary schooner. She carried motors as a backup. The tanks, if they were fuel tanks, were going to be critical evidence. I now needed to go down to the bottom and take a look with the team, not just to map and measure it all in, but also to take a detailed look at just exactly what was there. Along with those obvious features, there had to be other critical diagnostic pieces of evidence that could tell us we were on Malahat. The end of the First World War returned British Columbia to a peacetime economy. The large wooden schooners built during the war had served their purpose of providing the province's cargo-carrying needs and were now no longer required. With the return of steel ships, these wooden schooners were sidelined. It's around 1923, and it looks really bad for sailing ships making a good living in the deep water trade. A lot of them are tied up in backwaters. They're no longer able to make their way in the deep water trade. Malahat, there she is. She's sitting in Seattle. It looks like her days are over. An enterprising gentleman named Archie McGillis, he looks at her and he says, you know, if this is interesting, I think we got potential here because prohibition is still running strong in the States and we've just repealed it this year here in British Columbia. I think we can uh, make a go of it here. I mean, uh, we can provide a service here and make a, a, a good dollar at it. So what they did is they brought the, the, the Malahat over to Vancouver, into Vancouver Harbor. They would pull her alongside a bonded warehouse in Vancouver Harbor, shift over 50 to 60,000 cases. And we're talking good quality liquor here. We're talking the best single malts from Scotland. We're talking brandies. We're talking about Portuguese port. Everything. So what, what essentially they've created is a floating liquor emporium to take down to our thirsty neighbors down there in California that just love having a good time. As prohibition continued, and despite the efforts of law enforcement, the trade of illegal liquor flourished. In 1924, the Department of Commerce estimated that $40 million worth of illegal liquor was crossing the border into the U.S. In 1928, doctors made another $40 million writing prescriptions for medicinal whiskey. The demand for legal sacramental wine had increased by 800,000 gallons by 1924 and the number of liquor-related offenses in federal court jumped from 35,000 in 1923 to over 61,000 by 1932. Instead of purging demon rum from the land, prohibition had created an underground economy. On the West Coast, the five-masted Malahat was doing her part to supply this economy. Each trip aboard the Malahat might last months. In the early days of the trade, she made two or three voyages a year. In the waning years, she would make one. While at sea, the Malahat would be resupplied by the smaller, faster boats of the Rum Runner fleet. Generally, the cargo was sacked, 
meaning the bottles were removed from their cases and sewn into gunny sacks, which were easier to handle and took up less room. The sacks would be loaded aboard by hand, one at a time. The most dangerous time for rum running was when a small delivery boat, like a Speedy 750, so-called because of the number of cases they carried, tied up to the Malahat to pick up its prepaid order. For this was when the Coast Guard would catch them in the act. This is an example of probably a smaller rum runner. Um, the flat bottom, and as you can see, it looked pretty much like a, a regular speedboat at the time. However, they could load like in the bow, and of course back here in the stern, load in cases of scotch, uh, <laughs> whiskey or gin, whatever they were carrying. And the boats were, uh, some of them were pretty specialized. They had uh, oversized engines. Uh, one of them, I remember, even had twin Liberty aircraft engines in it, and probably several others besides that one. So they were built for speed, very fast. Uh, like you say, there was hot rod cars. This would be a hot rod boat for the time. And um, the Coast Guard would chase them, but they, they seldom caught them. The next day is raining. The team returns to the site. Yesterday, the team went in, we laid a baseline, we were getting some sense of how big the ship is. Today, we're gonna go in, we're gonna take a more detailed look. We're looking for some specific features on this wreck that'll help us identify just what it is or what it isn't. And that's rather critical because you have to go through this chain of evidence, piece by piece, methodically, like it's a lab experiment, in order to identify a ship on the bottom. With this second dive, the team hopes to add to the archaeological data gathered during Mike's initial survey of the wreck. Dropping down to the wreck, it was clear that we were looking at a large wooden vessel that had been fitted with propellers. Measuring the strut which supported the propellers, I was struck by the fact that these were rather small. This was not a ship that depended upon the propeller as the central means of propulsion. The evidence suggested that we were looking at an auxiliary schooner, a ship that used engines only as an assist. Swimming along the side of the hull, we mapped and measured in the location of the chain plates. Chain plates are a big, flat strap of iron bolted to the side of a ship that support the stays or the rigging that holds a mast in place. The number of chain plates on the side of a hull tells you how many masts a ship had. And the way the chain plates are spaced one after the other shows you how many stays there were and what kind of lines connected to the mast. And that tells you what type of rig. Looking at the wreck on the bottom, we found five chain plates. And the way they were spaced indicated that we were on a schooner. Everything we saw on the bottom matched up exactly with what we knew about Malahat. We also found fuel tanks on the bottom. The tanks and the struts were large things that would not have been stripped out. But there was evidence that the vessel had been stripped just the same. We couldn't find much in the way of artifacts. The only artifact that hinted at any human activity aboard the ship was a lone remnant, a cup that we found on the bottom. It would have been great to have found some bottles of whiskey or some other evidence of her days on Rum Row that had been hidden in the bilges only to be forgotten and then survive the years as a logging barge and as a wreck. But the only evidence of drinking we found was this cup.
Drinking during the Roaring Twenties was a billion dollar business. It was estimated that in 1920, Americans drank 25 million gallons of illegal spirits. To meet this demand, a complex supply network evolved under the nose of the Coast Guard and police. In the early days, the Coast Guard simply did not have the resources to pursue the countless small boats involved in the trade. But as years went by, rum running became much more dangerous. At one point, it was estimated that 200 civilians had been killed during prohibition-related interventions. Rum running was becoming a risky business. Well, the reason uh, there were so many deaths by the uh, smugglers and the rum runners were because the Coast Guard did not hesitate to shoot in those days. If the rum runner was fleeing, the Coast Guard, the only way they could stop them, because so many of the rum runners' boats were much faster than the Coast Guard, was they shot. And if they shot and, and killed the, the rum runners, so be it. You know, unlike today. Bootleggers became gangs, and gangs grew into organized crime on the East Coast and along the Great Lakes. The trade in illegal booze bred violence and corruption as crime syndicates competed for their share of the tape. Chicago is probably the focal point because it got the most publicity. You had, you know, uh, Al Capone and Bugs Moran shooting each other up on the streets, whereas New York with uh, Lucky Luciano and Dutch Schultz, it was more organized. They didn't fight. Uh, uh, like they did in Chicago. So, and, and you had it in every city. Detroit had their, their you know, gangsters and smugglers and, and bootleggers. So did Seattle and, and Los Angeles and um, Phoenix too. Uh, but Chicago got all the play because, you know, I mean, gangsters were being shot down every day by the gangs and the fighting, you know, who got the south side and who got sold the booze on the north side. And of course, you know, Al Capone couldn't, you know, blink his eyes without the, you know, the media playing him up. The markups on contraband liquor were outrageous, and the profits were staggering. Gang kingpin Al Capone netted $60 million from the liquor trade, the equivalent of $2 billion today. While Chicago stole the limelight with its gang's glamour and violence, the West Coast trade also proved very profitable and much more respectable. Now, you might get the impression that uh this is kind of a swashbuckling adventures of the Caesar, you know, like and maybe the mob's going to get involved, maybe there's going to be hijacking and piracy. But no, no, up here in Canada, prohibition's ended, it's all legitimate. You can establish yourself in a hotel and sell liquor, get a license and whatnot. So it was all above board, and some of the characters involved, remember, it was quite a stimulus to the economy in Vancouver Harbor. There was all these people employed on the waterfront. There was all the crews aboard all these different vessels. It was something like a fleet of 60 ships uh, by the mid-20s or late 20s, um, feeding this uh, market across the line. Over the 13 years of prohibition, the Malahat would deliver millions of bottles of liquor and earn the reputation on the West Coast as the queen of the rum runners. When we're down on the bottom looking at a ship or a shipwreck, what we're doing is not just getting an impression. We're taking exact detailed measurements that we can then match up with the historical record. Measuring the tanks proved that they were exactly the right size for a motor vessel like Malahat. In fact, they matched identically. Documenting the ship meant not just measuring one set of features like the tanks, it meant moving along the entire length of the wreck, mapping, documenting each feature that we found. Bit by bit, piece by piece, we gathered the details that we need to come to a conclusion. The evidence that suggested this was Malahat boiled down to the fact that this wreck was a wooden auxiliary schooner as long as Malahat, and we could tell that from the length of the wreckage from the stern at the struts to the bow, where we found a hawse pipe where the anchor chain would have passed out of the hull. The chain plates, which showed that this had been a five-masted vessel, and the spacing of the chain plates that showed that the rig was that of a schooner. The other measurements showed how large the timbers had been, and these measurements, like those of the struts in the tanks, matched the surviving plans. All of this evidence, collected systematically and scientifically, gave us a real sense that if this wasn't Malahat, it was one of her sister ships.
Unlike many of the vessels in the rum trade, the Malahat was never seized, never caught with contraband in territorial waters. Indeed, her crew actually developed a relationship, although an uneasy one, with the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard protected the schooner from hijackers, and in return, the occasional case of good stuff would make its way back to the government cutter. Gradually, the market for smuggled liquor began to wane. In an attempt to undercut the high price of the real McCoy, American bootleggers manufactured their own liquor in ever-increasing quantities. They grew adept at copying the labels and bottles of brand name liquors, selling their counterfeit booze for much less than the genuine article imported from Canada. From all accounts, some of it was even pretty good. And it was amazing stuff. I swear to God, it was like water. And you had about three drinks and just like somebody hit you over the head. <laughs> it, was a dead, it was so smooth. And then it must have been about 150 proof or something. And then just, you're sitting there, well, God, there's nothing to this stuff, you know. <laughs> it was a good moonshine you can't beat. The competition provided by the moonshiners, combined with the increased speed and efficiency of the Coast Guard boats, diminished Malahat's profits, and business began to wane. But even in the final years, she was still stocking up for at least one voyage a year. It all came to an end in 1933 with the repeal of prohibition by Franklin Roosevelt. Breweries long idle were fired up and beer and liquors flowed once more. An eager public toasted the end of a noble experiment with legal glasses of their usual. The Malahat's reign was over. Eventually, she was sold to West Coast timber entrepreneurs as a logging ship. She continued her labors until 1944, when she was caught in a gale and pounded by the British Columbia logs held within her hold. Worn and tired, her working days were over, and she was reportedly abandoned. She went down in history as the queen of the rum runners. The question is, where does she lie? John, I think, you know, Shock and I, you know, been conferring. There, it looks like Malahat. So, given what you've seen on the bottom today, is there anything that indicates that this is uh, potentially one of those steamer class of vessels that were built uh, concurrently in the United States, those, those wooden vessels? Definitely not, John. We've got clear length that reaches what, what John? 74 meters. 74 meters, that's, and the frames are huge, um, iron fastened big softwood construction, auxiliary motor sailor, looks like a schooner rig. Uh, everything I'm seeing, you're seeing. We've got a vessel that is of the, uh, the right length, right dimensions, right. obviously some sort of auxiliary powered vessel, uh, five chain plates, just five masts. Everything we're seeing on the bottom sure looks like one of those Mabel Brown class Canadian built motor sailing vessels right. from the First World War. This looks like Malahat. I just, there's nothing that has a name on it down there. Though, I mean, the only thing that'll conclusively nail it is something in the archives. But if we don't find that, I still feel, you know, that's the map, somehow that's the Malahat sitting down there. So what's the next logical step? I think it's to dig in the archives. Although the team is satisfied with the data they have added to the historical records of this wreck, they're disappointed that their information has been inconclusive and the wreck remains a mystery. Nevertheless, for the sea hunters, visiting this site and diving this fascinating shipwreck is its own reward. But then, things take a sudden and dramatic turn. Out of nowhere, and to everyone's great surprise, a long hidden clue, perhaps the final piece of the puzzle, unexpectedly emerges. Finally, we get a call from a gentleman here in Paul River that's doing some work, looking in the old mill archives, and lo and behold, he contacts us, he says, I've been looking through some old filing cabinets, been gathering dust down in the basement, and I have this little clip here of telegrams mentioning this vessel called the Malahat. Do you, do you know anything about it? And I said, my God, do I know about it? I said, we've been looking for this for so long. And as it happens, here it is, like this, this telegram dated November 9, 1945, and it's to attention, Mr. D.A. Evans. Break, Breakwater Hulk Malahat will be at Paul River 12.30 p.m. today. Captain has been advised to get tie-up instruction from Powell. 
Would you please pass this information on to scholar signed George O'Brien? And here it is, the actual document that ties this mystery wreck in Powell River puts a name on the hull as the Malahat. I mean, that, that was just so satisfying when we finally received this. I mean, it just tied the whole story together. In underwater archaeology, you're always looking for a smoking gun to identify a ship. A bell, a nameplate, something that says, yes, this is it. Oftentimes, in the absence of that type of concise documentation, you're left with some element of doubt. You match everything up scientifically bit by bit. Maybe it's the right size, the right shape, and in the right place, and all the pieces come together and you feel, yes, this is it. But you never know for certain. In the case of the wreck at Powell River, though, the dives and the discovery of the telegram found in the basement archives clearly stated that Malahat had not come to an end at Barclay Sound, but had been brought around to Powell River where it had been sunk. That's all we needed. That was the smoking gun. That piece of paper put Malahat exactly at Powell River and showed us that the vessel on the bottom that had matched in every other circumstance was indeed Malahat, the queen of Rum Row. The history books were wrong, and thanks to archeology span and a fortunate discovery in the archives, we'd put the final piece of the puzzle together and had closed the book with new information that clearly said, this was the end of the fabled Malahat. And so ends the mystery of the famous Malahat, a ship whose story reads like a pulp adventure novel. As a rum runner dodging the law and earning big money, the Malahat left behind a legend that will forever live along Canada's west coast. Hers is a tale of an era long past, of wooden ships, bathtub gin, and smugglers sailing into danger in the dark of night. And now it's your turn to get up off that couch and go into the deserts, go into the mountains, go under the lakes, the rivers, and the seas, and search for history. You'll never find a more rewarding adventure. Join us again as we search the oceans of the world for lost and famous shipwrecks. Another true adventure with The Sea Hunters. <laughs>